Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar titled ACA A to Z, a guide to the industry's best toolkit for fast data and microservices architectures. My name is Oliver White. I'm the chief storyteller and MC at Lightbend. And joining me is my partner in crime for all things ACA, Mr. Hugh McKee, who is an author, speaker, and our developer advocate at Lightbend. While I take a moment to introduce today's session and let any latecomers out there get their snacks ready, I'd like to ask our audience a quick poll question. For where you're at in your project at this time, what type of the following ACA features, these are commercial ones, would be most useful to you? So we've all heard of microservices, streaming data, event sourcing, and CQRS. These are pretty hot topics these days. But what about the less flashy stuff like concurrency, routing, self-healing, distributed persistence, clustering, delivery guarantees, et cetera? These are all the things that you need in order to get distributed systems done right. And the Akka Toolkit makes all of this pretty simple for Java and Scala developers who don't have the time to deal with all the low-level plumbing and manual wiring of things. Lightbend clients and industry leaders like Amazon, LinkedIn, Starbucks, Verizon, and others get all of these features out of the box, in addition to a handful of commercial features shown in the poll for our for Akka and other OSS tools. And those are all coming as part of Lightbend Enterprise Suite. So what makes Akka so special? Well, as an Akka veteran who has built distributed systems with everything but the kitchen sink before discovering Akka nearly a decade ago, he was really an ideal person to break it all down for us. So get ready for an illustrated journey that goes deep into how Akka works, from individual Akka actors to fully distributed clusters across multiple data centers. Today's webinar, which should last the entire hour, is made possible only by Lightbend's hundreds of happy customers, especially our client Hewlett Packard Enterprise, HPE, who you may have heard of. They're actually searching for many different positions uh, to have filled with talented engineers with experience in Akka, Scala, Spark, and other smack stack technologies in positions all over the world. You can find out more about their positions at careers.hpe.com and other open positions with our customers and partners on our website under the company tab. This webinar is being recorded as always. It will be shared with you next week. If you have questions, toss them into the questions tab in the GoToWebinar control panel. We'll see if we have time to them, uh, time to get around to them in the Q&A part. Also, if you're an existing subscriber, you know you can directly access our developer assist program, which goes far beyond simple bug fixes, so that you can ask our expert engineers questions about what ifs, how to's, best practices, and of course, your technical inquiries. All right, that's all for me for, me for now. Let's give a warm welcome to Hugh McKee. Hi, Hugh. Thanks for joining us today. Hi, Oliver. Thanks for having me, and thanks to everyone for listening in. Um, just a just a little bit of info. I've got I'm hopefully on the end tail end of a, a cold, a little bit of a cough. So I apologize in advance for um, um, <laughs> making some noise occasionally, but hopefully it won't be too bad. Um, and again, thanks for for listening in. So um, today. Sorry about this. Really wanted to um, to go over quite a bit of material. It's kind of a you know as the title says A to Z, so we're going to cover a lot of material. Uh, this webinar though is uh, there's a white paper that Oliver and I put together based on um, a prior broadcast of, of some of this material. So it's a pretty comprehensive document that you could download and and get uh, to to uh, dig into this in, in some more detail in, in a written document versus uh, audio and video. The other th book that you can download is this O'Reilly booklet that I did um, about a year or so ago that kind of gives an overview of ACA at, at a high level, but at a conceptual level. How do actors work? How do actors collaborate? How do they form systems? Things like that. It's a quick read, and the goal of that of this designing reactive systems was was really to kind of give an introduction to people that are curious about ACA and, and curious about actors and actor systems. So both of these are freely available for download and hopefully you can find some use from them. So before we get into um, ACA, just a little bit about Lightbend. Lightbend was founded back in 2011 with the co-founders of Martin Ordersky, who's the Scala creator, 
and Jonas Brunner, who was the ACA creator. So those two gentlemen got together, they formed a company, and that was the birth of, of Lightbend. Back then it was called TypeSafe, and um, about a year or so ago we changed the name of the company from TypeSafe to Lightbend. And then around 2013, um, we published a document called the Reactive Manifesto. This is kind of the, the birth of the concept of reactive. If you haven't visited the reactivemanifesto.org website, it's well worth your time to, if you're curious about reactive systems, which is definitely getting hot, not only from us, but many other people are talking about reactive systems these days. Um, this is a real good source of material for describing what is reactive and what are the principles behind reactive. And then around, say, I'm kind of skipping ahead, but around 2015, we started to get more tightly integrated with Spark, and our open source downloads were, were really starting to, to, to kick off. We were getting like a half a million downloads per month. And then as of last year, a lot of things happened. We, we acquired a company called Ops Clarity, which brings, brought in a, a really uh, awesome commercial offering from Lightbend for monitoring and, um, and doing, say, performance analysis of, of systems in general, not just our systems, but just kind of a, a collection of distributed systems. But we've also been working very hard on providing things for doing, say, monitoring at the ACA level. Um, our downloads have shot up to around six million per month, which is a really nice rate and a really nice increase from, say, 2015. A big thing for us is we launched the, what's called the Fast Data Platform, and this is a platform for doing analytics, streaming analytics. It's, it's a, a fully supported product from, from Lightbend uh, that integrates things like Spark and Kafka and, we, and Flink and, and other tools that we provide support for. And also we've formed a um, close relationship with IBM last year where they became one of our major investors. So last year was a big year, but you know, just this was just kind of a quick inter introduction that if you haven't uh, known or kind of been introduced to what Lightbend is or how long we've been around, this is kind of a quick syn synopsis of that. So anyways, <clears throat> the talk today. So what we're going to be doing is kind of doing from the bottom of this diagram up. We're going to start at the kind of the, the fine-grained molecular level at, at the actor level. And we'll move up to streams and then clustering and then finally kind of how this all comes together is, is the tools for building reactive systems. So there's a lot of territory that we're going to be covering here. But before I get into it, just real quick, ACA, which is a focal point of this talk, is really interesting in that it was, um, you know, as I mentioned, Jonas is the creator of Akka, which is basically the um, the bringing of the actor system to the JVM. And the actor system itself was actually initially created by a gentleman named Carl Hewitt way back in, 19, in the 1970s. And it was a very compelling type of different way of building systems, really, it, it, you know, building software systems. And we'll get into all, all this in a few minutes. But um, so it had an interesting history. Uh, Erling was one of the early adopters of, of actor systems. Um, actor systems became famous with Erling in you know, phone switching networks, you know, where the systems had to be built that just ran and never stopped, even when you're doing upgrades or replacing hardware or hardware breaks, things like that. The phone companies were very inspired by having systems that just, just ran no matter what was happening. And the actor system was a perfect fit for that. So this is um, really, ACA is really taking the actor system, bringing the actor system into the JVM with either uh, Scala or Java. You know, there's APIs for, for both. So starting at the beginning with actors, we're going to take a look at actors in general. The, the interesting thing about an actor is that, we're, in a way, we're breaking away from in kind of the imperative synchronous thread-heavy ways we've been doing system development for essentially ever. I've been doing software development for a long time, and I've got a long history of, of building imperative synchronous you know, thread-based systems. ACA is kind of a, a different approach for doing that that's asynchronous and it's not uh, thread heavy and, and, and things like that. And it's, it's, it's not imperative. It, it, it's a really, it's a different way of doing things 
but it's still familiar enough compared in the ways we you say if we grow, you've grown up as a, an impaired programmer moving to actors there is a, you know a learning curve but it's I don't think it's huge it's just there's kind of a conceptual leap that you have to make and that's what I want to try and show you here so first and foremost with ACA there's actors so an actor is implemented as software you know in in ACA in uh, Java or Scala you implement an actor is a is a class and actors um, it are instances of that class. But the difference is that none of the application code directly invokes any of the methods on an actor. It's all indirect through these asynchronous messages. So the only way that you can communicate with an actor is to send it a message. So um, one actor can talk to another actor by you know, sending it a message, or some, you know, say a web interface can interact with an actor by, you know, say you get a web request in, that re request is then translated into some kind of message sent to an actor, which triggers some kind of behavior for that for that actor. But the the big change here is that there's that this only this one way of communicating with an actor is sending it asynchronous messages. So what that means is that the sender is not waiting, is not blocked waiting for a response. A sender sends it a message, and that sender is free to go off and do something else. Or it could just go into a state where it's you know, the next thing it's expecting is maybe a response back. So an actor has this asynchronous message mechanism, and there's kind of you know a mailbox where messages that are sent up uh, sent to an actor you know, they're just fed into a mailbox, and the actor just consumes one message at a time. An actor only works on one message at a time, and it's, it just works through those messages in the mailbox. Its goal is to keep the mailbox empty. You know, processing all the messages that are, that are coming into it. So the, the typical behavior in, in an actor system is you have actors talking to each other. So say here we have actor A and actor B. Actor A sends a message to actor B, say this message is some kind of request from A asking B to do some work. B does that work, maybe it, B changes its state. And it, you don't have to do this, but this tip is common for say the uh, the actor, you know, in this case, actor B, may send a response message back. Now, it's not a not a synchronous request response cycle here. It's two asynchronous messages going in, in opposite directions. Actor A sends a message to B. A is free to continue on, maybe send messages to other actors, or or just wait for in, um, incoming messages to it. And B gets a message. It does whatever it's, you know it's designed to do, and then maybe it sends a message back to whoever sent it the message in the first place. So given that, um, and we'll, as we'll see as we get into uh, more of the material here, um, actors can run um, in a cluster, meaning that it, you're not constrained to a single JVM. So the, the, the situation may be that actor A is in one JVM, on one node or in one container or wherever it happens that JVM happens to be running. Actor B could be over the network somewhere else in another JVM running in another node or another container. Given that that's that's a fact that there's, and given that th these are asynchronous messages, there's no guarantee that actor B is there to respond to a message, say, that's coming from A. So there's this concept of, as you're building up an actor system, you're always kind of thinking of not only the happy path, but the alternate path, that you're thinking of, all right, when everything's working great, this is how the actors will behave, but you're also thinking of, what do I do when I don't get a response back from B? What's my contingency plan? So you kind of have your uh, plan A, and you ha and you have to think of your plan B. So in this case, a typical scenario is that an actor can easily and, and with very little code set up um, to send back. You know, its contingency plan is that it's going to wait for a certain period of time for a response back from B. If no response comes back from B, it's going to get another message sent to it that's set up by a timeout. So the timeout is I'll wait for a second or two seconds or you know, 100 milliseconds, whatever, it's the timeout is appropriate for the, the, the things that A and B are doing. But if actor B doesn't respond within that timeout period, then actor A is going to get a timeout message. So the scenario goes that say actor A tries to send a message to B, B's not there to get it. So instead of getting a response back from B, actor A gets back a timeout saying, hey, don't know what happened, B didn't respond, here's your timeout, deal with it, go into plan B. So the it's this kind of 
idea that you're you're building systems where failure is not kind of thought of in, uh, after the fact. You're thinking about things right from the very beginning. What do I do when um, my happy path didn't happen? Yeah. You know, so what I like to think of it is that failure is an architectural feature, not an afterthought. And it it just kind of builds from there. I mean, it builds up from um, from this where um, actors can create other actors, you know, there's this kind of this supervisor worker relationship and, or parent child relationship. And the resiliency kind of builds in there in that say um, the idea is that if an actor is doing something and something goes wrong, say it gets an exception, generally what the approach is that the actor that had the ex exception doesn't deal with the exception, it's the supervisor that deals with the exception which is an, the parent actor or the supervisor actor. So there's this well-defined supervision strategy approach that's built into the way you set up actors that you can customize you know, to do what, you know, whatever you want to do when you, you handle some kind of a problem, handle some kind of an exception. But the general um, supervision strategy is that an exception occurs and depending on the, the type of exception, the type of problem, you can decide, well, I'm just going to resume that actor that had the problem or I'm going to restart that actor so the actor kind of comes back in a known good state, or this is really bad, I'm going to just stop this actor. The other option is that, say, A here is the supervisor. It looks at this exception and goes, wow, this is really bad. I, I'm not equipped to handle it. It can escalate the problem up to its parent or its supervisor and say, hey, I, got a pro I have a problem. It, you know, it initially started down on one of its workers, but now A says, this is too big for me to handle. It's going to escalate the problem up. So there's this whole idea of, of a kind of a hierarchy of supervision strategies for, for dealing with errors, which is kind of different than the way we normally handle exceptions in, in, our, in our code. So it's not unusual to have a hierarchy of actors that you set up where it's you have these supervision strategies, but it's also kind of a delegation of work in that the higher level actors are doing higher level decision processes and they're delegating out lower level work or more commonly risky work out to workers. So here I'm trying to show a little bit of a deeper hierarchy and say these leaf nodes that are kind of orange or red, they're the ones doing something risky, say like they're reaching out over the network, hitting a database or hitting some external service where it's likely that from time to time, those services are because they're doing that risky behavior will get exceptions. So by delegating out these risky behaviors out to worker actors and and using the supervision strategies that uh, are available to you between the parent and the child, you can kind of set up blast shields in a way in that the dangerous work is happening at the edge, but the um, and so they can take a hit and the supervisors see the, the problem happening, but they're not directly, say, getting the exception. They're, they're, getting, they're seeing the exceptions happening in their children. It's a really nice way to kind of divide and conquer work, but it's also to, to divide and conquer handling problems in, in these um, hierarchies of actors. So here, for example, we have actor A1 created B1, B1 created a bunch of worker actors, say C3, and then C3 um, created even more actors, you know, say at these final actors, these D3, D1, you know, D2, 3, these actors are the ones doing some kind of database operation or some kind of network operation that uh, occasionally gets exceptions. <clears throat> the other thing is that, you know, with these, this relationship, um, there's some interesting things that you can do, like a, a, a common pattern is that some actors are routers. So in this little diagram I'm showing, say, NB, are going to be asking this R actor, this router actor, to do work. But the R actor itself isn't actually going to be doing the work. It's the worker actors that are going to do it. So say A sends in a request to R. R forwards that request off to one of its workers. So now that worker is actually doing the work that A wants it to do. So while that worker is doing that work for A, say B sends in another request to R. R does the same thing. It forwards a request off to one of its workers. What, and now you've got a, a, a form of concurrency here that you're, you're kind of doing multi-threaded pro, multi programming without a lot of the complexity. This is really straightforward to set up in ACA. 
very, you know, once you get comfortable with you know, messaging and, and, and things like that with, with ACA actors, doing these kind of highly concurrent operations becomes kind of second nature. It becomes much easier to do than trying to do any kind of thread-based programming that, um, that we often have to do, say, in Java or Scala, especially in Java. But from the perspective of A and B, it's R that's doing the work. R is the hero here. But R has kind of abstracted the fact that it's delegating work out to subordinates. But you know, from A and B, it, R looks like you know as a black box. How R actually solves or you know, does the work that A and B wants it to do is is really not their concern. The other part of this that gets kind of interesting is that A sends a message to R. R tries to you know, have a worker do some work. That worker has a problem. It gets an exception. Here's the ex the exception gets. Sent, you know, is handled by R. It's not handled by A. You know, think about in, in our normal, in kind of imperative coding practices where we're bubbling exceptions up through our code, and all the callers have to deal with those exceptions. You know, you know, uh, the caught exceptions that you have to deal with. In this case, the the idea is that it's the supervisor is the one that's designed to know how to, to deal with the exceptions that its workers get. Not A, but R is the one that is knows how to do it. So A and B don't incur that overhead. The only thing A and B have to really do is they have to have kind of their plan A and plan E, plan B. Plan A is they send a message to R, the work gets done. Plan B is that it sends a message to R, the work doesn't get done, and it has to have that uh, contingency plan, which is often handled with this kind of a timeout approach. So that was really quick going through actors. There's tons and tons of other things. Um, to talk about with actors is there's a lot of material related to this. It's a fascinating area. To me, it's one of the most fun things I've ever done in software development is, you know, is implementing actors, writing actors, leaving actors to work together, things like that. So actors are message driven, they're stateful, uh, and they're uh, they, the only way you talk to actors is you, you pass it in asynchronous messages. As we looked at very briefly, actors can create other actors to form hierarchies and, and supervision hierarchies. And the big thing, and this is sometimes um, uh, where people have to kind of get used to it, the, the thinking is that sometimes actors are heavyweight, and, and it's quite the opposite. Actors are extremely lightweight. They have a very small memory footprint, and they're really lightweight because they don't hold threads. Actors only use threads when they have something to do and actors are inherently not blocking, so whatever they have to do, they do it very, very quickly. They only use a thread for a very, very short period of time, and then that thread is free to be used by other actors that need to do some work. So it's a very efficient, very lightweight um, way of building systems. And it's not unusual for actor-based systems to scale to the level of tens or hundreds or millions of actors per JVM, not counting, you know, say, per cluster, So as we'll see as we get into clusters. So let's move into Streams. Streams is relatively new. It came out a couple of years ago. It's built on Akka. Um, many of you may know that you know, Reactive Streams was a feature that came out in Java 9. We were heavily involved in the development of the Reactive Streams uh, definition and the standard that came out. The, you know, the big thing with Reactive Streams is that they're asynchronous and they're, they, um, they, they work by back, through back pressure, meaning that just like what I'm trying to show in this picture, the it's the it's what's ahead of you is kind of determining how fast the whole system can go. So in this case, we see a bunch of brake lights. The brake lights are kind of telling everybody behind them, hey, slow down, because I can only go so fast. That's exactly what's happening in, in a reactive stream in that the downstream components signal the upstream components how much they can consume. Therefore, the producers of the data don't overwhelm the consumers of the data in, in, the, in the stream flow. So let's take a quick look at it. In Java, the terminology is publisher, processor, subscriber, and subscription. In Akka, which is implemented on top of this, uh, the, reactive, um, uh, the reactive streams definition in, in Java, it's source, flow, and sync. It's same things, it's just a different terminology. But you know the sync, the flow, the source, the, the sync can signal back pressure to the flow. The flow can signal back pressure to the source. So the idea is that the source maybe maybe it can produce message at a very high rate, 
but the sink can only consume it at a slower rate. Well, through back pressure, the source can't overwhelm the sink, which can cause big problems where, say, if you're buffering messages that are being sent down the stream, you could uh, run out of mem memory. You, you could blow the JVM's memory. You can get a lot of memory uh, you know, problem in, in the JVM, which is pretty fatal. Um, so in this case, there's that, this flow control mechanism that's built into reactor streams, which is certainly built into ACA streams. Things are really getting interesting in streams as well in that you know, the idea is that um, because everybody's following the same reactive stream standards, if say you're building something with ACA streams and you build something that something else that you know like RX or something that is also based on the reactive stream standard, they can play with each other, they can communicate with each other. And also now we're getting to the point where streams can span multiple machines. Uh, ACA introduced, I think just a few months ago, the um, uh, stream reference, where a stream can now not be constrained to a single JVM, so you can have a flow that spans multiple JVMs. The stream API is really rich. Um, it's very functional oriented, and there's a lot of methods that are available. In fact, sometimes it's really overwhelming how many how many methods there are that you can use and how many things you can do in a stream. But there's things like filter and fold and, and map and zip, you know, t the typical kinds of functional operations that you would do in any kind of flow processing and that, that goes with uh, reactive streams. And you're not constrained to simple streams either. You can have streams that get more like a graph where, and this is, I pulled this right from the documentation in ACA, this diagram and this, this, the sample code, we're showing, say, a, a non-trivial graph with a, with a feedback loop. You've got segments in the graph where they're fanning out, um, you know, one source in, two sources out, or fanning in, two sources, two sources in, one source out. You, know, you, you can do some really interesting flows. And the code is not that, you know, the code below here is implementing the graph above. And this is Scala. And here's an example of the same uh, implementation of this graph in Java. Not a ton of code. Um, and it, you're doing some really powerful things with it. Also, uh, ACA HTTP was introduced uh, not too long ago, and it's bit, uh, based on streams, which makes a lot of sense because when you think about it, you get an HTTP request, and no matter how it's implemented, basically you're, you're, you're taking that request, doing some work on it, and it, it, you're really translating the request into a response. So here we're kind of formalizing the stream where the request comes in, it goes into a stream, and the, the sync of the stream is the HTTP response. So in between there is, you know, we're doing the work that, of building the response from the request. And it's all implemented with kind of a back pressure stream. WebSockets is, is the same thing. With OCK HTTP, we can do WebSockets where you can have a stream in and a stream out, or you can have a request in, a single request in, but it triggers a stream out. Or you can have a stream in and a response out. You know, so a lot of flexibility here, but the, again, the concept's the same, is that the actual flow, the, the processing of the input to the output is handled through the mechanics of the, of the stream itself. Um, there's another feature of ACA called Alpaca, which is a alternative to Apache Camel, all stream-based, reactive stream-based, back pressure stream-based. This project was initially driven by the community, the ACA uh, contributor community. But now Lightbend has um, allocated two engineers to, I think it's two engineers to be full-time on, on forwarding um, Alpaca, which really comes down to, just like with Camel, and Camel is famous for having lots of uh, connectors. We're building up the suite of connectors for Alpaca as well. That there's around 30 or 40 of them now and it's just constantly growing as, as more and more people contribute. And I think it's going to grow even faster now that, now that we've assigned Lightbend engineers to this also. Here's a quick example of some code, it's some Java code that um, takes a couple of sources, you know, say a, a source from a file and a, a source of some images. It, so that, you know, it's Wikipedia data, so we're getting some text, we're enriching it with some images. And then, so those are the you know the connectors on the input, and on the output, we're pushing it out to uh, 
Amazon S3 and to Kafka. So it's fairly tight code, um, and it, it's just really kind of a stream-based type of approach to doing, you know, pulling data from various types of sources and pushing the data out to other uh, types of sinks. Um, streams is big, very popular. People that are using it really love it. Uh, some people use it ex just because they like the, the whole reactive streams. But uh, I really didn't show anything here, but there's a really nice relationship between streams and actors. And there's, there's a lot of documentation on this. Uh, there's been some really great talks and, and uh, blogs about this. And there's, a, there's some really interesting examples and um, capabilities provided where you can have actors doing what actors do well, working with streams with what streams do well. There's a really nice synergy between the two that works out very, very nicely. It's not kind of a, you know, streams isn't a replacement for actors, and you know, actors are still very, very important, and, and there's a really nice new pattern for using uh, the two together in, in very effective ways. So stepping up the game a little bit here, up to the cluster level. This is where, I, this is what really intrigued me when I first came to NOACA, where, yeah, I, I mean, as, so I, I was a Java developer and used to building systems where everything we did was inside a single JVM. I mean, we could, we could stand on multiple uh, instances of that JVM, but those JVMs are running independently of each other. Then ACA comes along, it's like, now we can have JVMs, multiple JVMs working together collectively as a single system, where not only are these systems tightly integrated with each other, but as a developer and an architect, it was easy to implement systems where you had actors talking to each other across the network, you know, sending messages across a, a, a network, a, a cluster of JVMs running on different machines or in different containers. So it really expands um, the kinds of things that you can do with a system. You're not, from a performance standpoint, you can grow the cluster to get more capacity. From a reliability standpoint, you're not putting all your eggs in one basket you know, in a single JVM. If that JVM goes down, um, you know, the system goes down safe. Here, you, you can build systems where if you need more processing capacity, you add more nodes. If you want to reduce the processing, processing capacity to save money, you reduce nodes. If you take a hit, say uh, something goes down unexpectedly, the system as a whole can deal with it and, and keep running as, almost as if nothing's really happened. This was a marvelous new playing field uh, to come into. So the idea is that you can uh, contract either by uh, because you want to contract or because you had to contract because, because something failed, or you can expand because you need more capacity. You can add more nodes to the cluster, and so you're basically just adding processing capacity. The marvelous thing here is that the, you can build the systems at the actor level that know how to deal with this, you know, know how to deal with nodes leaving the cluster and know how to deal with nodes joining the cluster. We're gonna show a couple examples of, of this. The cool thing is, is that Akka itself is, is managing all this. As developers, we're writing code that maybe is aware, you know, I call it cluster aware code, but we're not doing all the heavy lifting of dealing with all this. This is, Akka itself is doing things like monitoring all the nodes in the cluster. It has formal life cycles of nodes as shown in this diagram that I pulled from the documentation. You know, a node is joining, it's up, it's leaving, it's exiting, it's down, things like that. This is all managed by ACA, and we're writing actors and uh, building a system that, that knows how to behave properly in this kind of environment. So <clears throat> one area that's really interesting is it's called cluster sharding, and this is a feature of ACA, and it's something that's provided by ACA that is some clever use of, of predefined ACA actors that can do some really cool stuff for us here. So in this situation, say we have a large collection of actors that it's so large that say it's too big, too big to fit inside the memory of a single JVM, so you, you really have to uh, split these actors across multiple JVMs. Or just as importantly, maybe you don't want to put all the actors in a single JVM. You'd like to distribute the actors across multiple JVMs. And as an example, these are say, they're all the same actor. It's the same class that you use to implement it. It's just you have lots and lots of instances of the this, this same actor. 
So say it's, it's an actor that's responsible for handling the state of some kind of entity, like a bank account or an order or whatever. Um, the idea here is that you know, it's the same actor, but it's you know, multiple instances of actor that you, you have a large collection of. So the, the, with cluster sharding, what can be done is you can distribute this collection of actors across a cluster. So the way, the way that works is that there's this concept of grouping actors by some kind of a shard. And the shard is, um, is um, defined basically by taking some kind of a defined identifier for each of these uh, actors and like the, the primary key, for example, of an entity, you know, the, the ID. The ID is used to, say, do some hashing to come up with a shard ID. But it's, it's basically just some math, and you're just grouping actors by shard. So then when, when you actually run this, what's happening is that the actors are distributed across the cluster. So what I'm trying to show here in this diagram is that on top, we kind of got this logical view of a large collection of actors that are grouped together by shards. And then down below here, each of these boxes is a cluster uh, node running in an ACA cluster. So the shards are mapped to different nodes in the cluster. Now, the, the, the other nice thing about this is that if, I want, if you have some actor that wants to send a message to one of these, other, these entity actors in cluster sharding, the routing of that message is handled by uh, cluster sharding. Us as, you know, we as developers, we don't have to deal with the routing, but uh, I'll show you in a moment how that works, but it's very simple for you to send a message to any one of these actors, regardless of where it happens to be um, in the cluster. The, uh, so the idea is say this shard that I've got the circle on, you know, is happens to map to the, the first node. The nice thing here is that when one of the nodes goes down, say because you want to take it down because you don't need capacity, or it was taken down because whatever this JVM was running in, the underlying system went down, or or some other reason, but that node went away, those shards in the past mapped to that, say that fourth node, are automatically mapped to other nodes, the remaining nodes in the cluster. So, um, the state has to be recovered of these things, uh, and and that's defined in, when you look at cluster sharding. That, there's no magic here. The magic is then is really in that the handling of where is a particular actor at in the cluster, depending on the, the, the current topology or the current state of the cluster itself, is handled by cluster sharding. And it's kind of, the goal is to kind of evenly distribute this logical collection of actors across a cluster of nodes. So say this shard that used to be on node four now maps to node one. The way this works is there's some uh, actors that cluster sharding has already defined for us. There's what's called a shard coordinator and there's a shard region. So the idea is that if somebody, something is sending a command, saying uh, send a message to a entity actor, the idea is that that message is sent to the shard region actor on the node that the sender is on. So in this example, say on node two, there's an actor that's sending um, a message, which say is a command to some um, actor that's only identified as by its MDID. This region, a uh, shard region actor gets that message, and if it doesn't know where that shard happens to be, which it can remember if it's seen it before, but say in this case, it's never seen a request for entity one, two, three, what it does is it goes to what's called a, a shard coordinator, which is a cluster singleton. There's only one instance of this actor anywhere in the cluster, which also, by the way, there's a whole section on setting up cluster singletons if you wanted to use your own kind of cluster singleton. In this case, cluster sharding is also using cluster singletons. So it's this shard coordinator is the one that decides where something maps to. It, entity, it knows how to decide where entity one, two, three maps to and what chart is it in, in, in the current cluster. So it, the, the uh, shard region sends a message to the cluster of the shard coordinator, the coordinator sends back a response to the region, and the region says, in this case, a, <coughs> it got a message back that the shard for this entity happens to be on node three. 
So it kind of goes through this kind of exchange of messages. All this is really being handled by cluster sharding. All we do as developers is we send a message to a shard region. The rest of it is all handled by cluster sharding. And our message is forwarded to our entity actor, wherever it happens to be on the cluster. <clears throat> so that's, I know I'm going really fast here, but this is basically how it's set up. There's Hakka cluster sharding. <laughs> Excuse me, it's set up his own actors. And those actors collaborate with each other to figure out how to distribute the entity actors across the, the cluster. Um, <clears throat> the, the coding for this is really straightforward. It's a little bit of setup. And then the, uh, the actual exchange of messages is really simple uh, to do. Uh, so it's lots of examples in um, the ACA documentation for this. So building on this, on cluster sharding, is what's called ACA persistence and ACA persistence query, which is really event sourcing and command query responsibility segregation. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> um, I'm going to blast through this real quick. If you Event sourcing and CQRS is a whole topic on its own. I've done myself just whole talks on just that. It's really interesting area. It's a very hot uh, thing that's going on, especially in the microservice space. Here's an implementation using cluster sharding where the idea is that each entity, again, it's like a bank account or an order, each actor is handling a, a, sp a specific entity identified by its primary key. A command comes in, say, I want to do a deposit. It comes into the actor. The actor persists that as an event. You know, so the command is like an intent to do something. And an event is a, a statement of fact, something that's happened in the past. So an event is persisted, say, in some kind of database, Cassandra or, or whatever. And then once it's safely persisted, the entity updates its state. So say it's a deposit, so it adds a deposit amount to the account. And then um, there's also this concept of um, taking the events and pulling them over to, for, to what's called the read side, which is also the, for queries. So again, this is a big area. Um, Lots that lots of material that uh, available on this, but just wanted to show you very briefly that uh, with cluster sharding, it's the, the foundational piece of doing event sourcing in CQRS with ACA. And if you look in the documentation, it's called ACA persistence and ACA persistence query. Really cool stuff. Similarly, there's this this is distributed data or uh, um, published subscribe where again. ACA is providing a set of actors that collaborate with, with each other, and it's simplifying the, the task for us as developers to implement like a, a, a simple publish subscribe type of mechanism, where you know we have these mediator actors, which are part of uh, publish subscribe, and the, the basic way it works is that say you have an actor, I, I'm calling it a publisher, this P actor it sends a message to a mediator to say, hey, I want to let all the subscribers know or forward this message off to all my subscribers. The mediator knows that it's got counterparts on each uh, node in in the cluster. So it, it forwards that message off to its counterparts across the cluster. And they, and they in turn push that message off to all the subscribers. So this it's the same thing as a as a developer, all we have to do is is send a message to our local mediator and we're done. The mediator then is responsible for sending the messages off to all the subscribers across the cluster. Pretty cool stuff. There's another feature called conflict-free replicated data types. Similar kind of an approach that say we have a, um, instead of a mediator, we have a replicator actor. There's one replicator actor per node in the cluster. And then we have a bunch of actors that represent the state of different key value pairs. You know, so in this diagram, I'm showing like key one, key two, key three which is replicated across all the nodes in the cluster. And then we have this actor that we write as developers say that wants to interact with these key value pairs, uh, replicated key value pairs. So the idea is to say that the, um, the updater actor talks with, sends a message to his local, local replicator actor, hey, give me the value for key three. The replicator retrieves it and sends back a response to say, all right, here's the value for key three. And then, the updater goes, all right, I want to update the value of key three. So it sends a message to its local replicator. 
the local replicator forwards that message off to its counterparts across the cluster, and its counterparts each in turn, whenever they can, update the state of the key of, of the key's value across the cluster. So once again, the, the programming for us is quite simple, um, and it, there's these other actors that are kind of doing the heavy lifting for us. So a lot of interesting things here. Th these are examples like cluster sharding and and, um, and cluster singletons and distributed data and so on. These are examples of predefined out of the box actors that we get with Akka that do some um, interesting pattern. The other thing I'd like to emphasize though is that this, what's implemented in these existing out of the box features is not rocket science. And it's very common for Akka developers to do similar things on their own, where they create actors, say, that are cluster aware, that collaborate with each other, um, do some really interesting things. This is where I thought it was the most fun as a, as a developer using Akka, was using these things that come with Akka, but also um, building our own things that do, do things that are similar that work within, uh, within a cluster. It's really powerful stuff. So moving on, because we're running out of time, let's go up to clustering. Um, as I mentioned, you know, Akka runs, can run on a single node, and you can do plenty of things with just a single node, like Akka streams and actors talking to each other within a single JVM. Lots of people do that. But the real fun and the real power comes in when you start to build things in a cluster. So I like this. I, got, I actually got this idea for this picture from presentation that Jonas Bonaire did where he used a, a picture of meerkats because in a way meerkats um, this picture shows them in, in a stance where they they call it the sentinel position where they're they're looking out for predators for the community and this is kind of the way Akka works itself in that each node in the cluster is looking out for it, itself as well as the other nodes in the cluster they're constantly communicating with each other and it's constantly monitoring the state of the cluster. It, it, the, each node in the cluster it knows what other nodes are in the cluster and, and is constantly keeping track of how, how things are going. This is very powerful, and this is really the foundation of reactive. You know, as I mentioned at the beginning of this um, presentation, we, we came out with the reactive manifesto in 2013. The inspiration for reactive really came from Akka because if you look at it, you get resiliency because you can build systems where you can lose nodes, like I'm showing at the top here, and the cluster is still up. You know, say we had five nodes and we shrunk down to four because maybe a node failed. You know, there's this philosophy of let it crash. We don't care. We can build a system that can keep running when the cluster contracts, it loses nodes. And we have elasticity, which is another tenant of, of reactive, where if we need more processing capacity, we can add more nodes. And again, the cluster can behave very gracefully to this. Oh, another node's joined the cluster. Let's say if this cluster sharding, some of the shards now will map to that new node. You know, we're expanding out as the capacity of the cluster grows up. So the diagram at the very bottom here is the diagram for reactive. The reactive system is always responsive no matter what the load is or no matter what's breaking behind the scenes. And to make this all happen, it's message driven. Fundamentally, that's Sokka. So people are building systems, uh, services, in, 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 uh, monoliths, uh, using Akka. And there's kind of three different patterns. So there's Akka and Akka HTTP, very basic, um, um, you know, like a service where you have service endpoints being handled by Akka HTTP, and all the processing is, is is being done in Akka with Akka actors and Akka streams, or uh, some people at you know build web web apps or in or services using Play on top of which is built on top of Akka HTTP, which and Play can you you can easily build on top of an Akka cluster, so you can have Play front end you know handling the the traffic on the edge, and Akka actors and Akka streams doing the work in, in, inside. And then finally, the new kid in the block is Logum, which is a microservice framework, which is built on Play and Akka HTTP and Akka. So you can, uh, again, build a, a, a service using um, Logum, which is built on top of Akka. So the idea here is that the, it really doesn't matter what, 
approach or what technologies you're using um, to build your services. People are happily building Akka and Akka HTTP, Akka and Play, or Akka and Lagam. The thing, though, is that you have a cluster. You have the option of running in a cluster. And you get all the goodness of a cluster where you can expand out to add more capacity, you can contract in because you, you want to or because you had to because of failures. All three of these things, you, you're, you're basically building clustered services, which I think is, is very powerful. It gives you all those all the, uh, the, the goodness of, of building reactive systems. Uh, Akka gives us that foundational capability to do it. So the in, just in general with, with clustering, it's just the idea that we can handle those changes in the topology. Nodes come, they, nodes go, we can add nodes, we can move nodes, and the system itself keeps running. And a, a common pattern now is that people are, are building systems that work, it's a cluster, but it acts like a big uh, single JVM in effect. That, that least, that's the way I kind of look at it, is that I'm not constrained to a single JVM, I can have a system that um, I can send messages to actors across multiple JVMs and I'm not killing myself as a developer to do that. It's all straightforward, it's all easy to implement. All right, so getting close to the end here. Um, Things are really interesting these days, I think, in that we're we're building systems that we're kind of moving from monoliths, and in many of you are moving to um, multiple services or to, you know multiple systems that are collaborating collaborating with each other. So it really, we're kind of building a, a city of services, so especially if you're moving into any kind of microservice type of an architecture. Now you're, you're you're really moving into multiple services that are working together and and uh, uh, the services you know, here represented by buildings and the, the flow of inf messages between the services represented by the roads. So this is evolution that's going on where we have monoliths, which not, I'm not saying that anything is not the way to do it. I'm not saying that, oh, yeah, you should be going to microservices or anything like that. All these different approaches have their place. It's a matter of what makes sense for you. What makes sense for you is in, in terms of um, what risk you're willing to take because a lot of this is new, as well as you know, what are you trying to accomplish? In so many cases, a monolith is very appropriate and will still be appropriate for a long time. Or all, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, you know, there's a lot of interest in serverless, you know, um, lambdas and things like that. And kind of in between, there's uh, the concept of microservices or uh, distributed monoliths, which is, um, or microliths, which is, uh, as I'm showing this diagram, uh, down on the, on the left here, on the bottom, you say you have you have microservices, so you've broken up your code, but you haven't broken up the database. Whereas with uh, microservices, the the goal is to be as loosely coupled as possible. All these things work. All these things are good. All these things are different approaches. But uh, another point is that um, Akka can play a really important role in any one of these architectures. Because what we're trying to do is build systems where um, they're reactive it, because our demands of our users, demands of our business users, our customers, things like that, they, they want systems that just run 24-7, never stop, don't give me any grief, I want the system to behave. So part of the new architectures that we're dealing with is things like you have a system of services, if one of those services happens to go down, the other services are designed to compensate for that. With Akka, we take that a step further. If you build a service that's built on top of Akka, you can take a hit, say one of the nodes goes down, but the service itself is still up. We don't lose this, the service altogether. The service is still up. So I, I think that's a really powerful um, reason for having, I, I, I like to think of this as clusters within clusters. You know, at the, on the top, we have a big cluster of services, but individual services can be built on top of its own personal cluster as well. I'm um, going to take a quick look at some of the commercial offerings. You know, so we, for the most part, everything I've been talking about is all open source, but there's a, some commercial offerings that come with customers of Lightbend. And one of the more interesting ones is what's called a split brain resolver. So split brain happens when we get a network partition and the network is broken, say, you know, everything's still up and running, but all the nodes are running, but you've got a split. And so nodes on one side of the split can they can talk to each other, but they can't talk to nodes on the other side of the split. 
this is a, a common problem in distributed systems and the split brain resolver that um, that we provide deals with this where the idea is that when a split brain happens both sides of the, of the split independently decide which side is the winner and which side is the loser meaning that the winner side the nodes stay up the losing side the nodes shut down the idea is that we don't want work happening independently on both sides of the split we want to keep work happening within a cluster that all the nodes can see each other and talk to each other in the cluster. Other tools that we've we've got is there's a, a, a really rich set of monitoring tools you know, with Ops Clarity has a very powerful uh, monitoring tool for monitoring not only things happening within ACA but happening uh, across a, a very diverse set of technologies running on multiple machines. We also have a configuration checker. ACA conf configurations sometimes can get quite involved. And this thing, this configuration checker is a tool that can scan a configuration and give you suggestions if there's if it spots um, any kind of issues. It's kind of uh, uh, you know, uh, almost a, a compile in a way, of, of a, or at least a syntax check of a, 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 of a config, configuration. On the support side, there's a diagnostic recorder, and we've got great support with our subscriptions. Um, and one of the tools that we use is if somebody's having an issue with ACA, they can use this diagnostic recorder, which kind of takes the current state of the cluster, the configuration, other information, packages it all up, and ships, ships it off to the support team. So they have everything they need, including logs and things like that, to, uh, to try and help you uh, under, diagnose what's, what's going wrong. <clears throat> so in this uh, slide, we're, we're showing kind of the open source components. Many of these I talked about, like actors and streams and HTTP and so on. On the top and then on the bottom, there's the commercial offerings. So things like split brain resolver, uh, multi data center persistence, which is really interesting, something new that we introduced uh, not too long ago. Monitoring telemetry that we're very actively um, uh, filling out the capability there. We're always adding more and more capabilities for you know, doing instrumentation deep into ACA code, for example, into log on into play to present, you know, putting, presenting all that information to you in, in uh, various dashboards or screens or ops clarity, things like that. So really what we're doing, what's happening, I think, is that we're moving into this world, and this is really where we're targeted, where on the one hand, you've got, say, reactive systems. On the other hand, you've got fast data analysis or cognitive an analytics happening. But to me, I think these two things work together. You know, the, the application side is producing data, you know, like the raw data that's fed into analytics. Analytics takes that raw data and produces insights or refined data that's fed back into the application side. So this is what we're focusing on here at Lightband is that we're trying to provide you with the tools to build the systems as well as uh, to do the analytics and make these, all, these things work to, together as a, as a single system and, and make, the, make them work well together. You know, uh, really have, you know, we're, we're obsessed with building or providing tools that let you build systems that are that are reactive. So Aka really is this tool toolkit for for building you know, these highly concurrent distributed systems, very resilient, and it's that's kind of the tool set for kind of building that that single mind. You know the the one side uh, capturing all the data, producing all the raw data. The other side doing kind of the cognitive analysis, machine learning, artificial intelligence stream analytics, whatever, having those two things work together is a, is a cohesive whole. So that's the tour. Um, I'm glad, hopefully, for those of you who stuck all the way through this, you know, we covered quite a bit of territory, but we went from actors all the way up to, uh, to reactive systems. I hope this kind of gave you, if you're new to ACA, um, it piqued your interest. You really want uh, to, to get more and more people to, uh, to look at this and, and use it. It's a, it's a marvelous tool. So really, and it, it's not just, I mean, there's a lot of talk about reactive, but we really try and define things or, or uh, identify things as there's reactive systems and there's reactive programming. And we're both we're addressing both. At the actor level, it's a way of doing reactive programming and it's uh, implementing things that work within a reactive system. So at this, I'll turn it back to, uh, to Oliver. Um, there's lots of customers that are using ACA, and back to you, Oliver. 
All right, Hugh, thanks. I know that you're a bit under the weather and your throat is probably quite raw at the moment. Um, I, I am astounded by the positive feedback and uh, amount of questions that we received this time around. Uh, for those of you who'd like to stay on for an additional five minutes of Q&A with Hugh, then you're welcome to do so. Otherwise, thank you for joining us and we'll be sending out the recording of this with the slides uh, in the next few business days. So Hugh, um, there was so many questions. I tried my best to get, kind of consolidate a lot of similar ones into a kind of meta question. And there were a few questions about uh, message uh, delivery guarantees for messaging. And I know that this is something you've been writing blogs on on um, our tech hub, which is developer.lightben.com. So the, the many questions came in about, you know, what kind of delivery guarantees can Akka do? And we've heard about, you know, this exactly once semantic. Um, but there's some there's some nuances to uh, thinking of exactly once messaging. Could you describe how Akka uh, looks at <coughs> messaging guarantees? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, it's really interesting area. And there's really three levels the way to look at it. There's a, um, at least once, and I like to think of it as maybe once. There's <laughs> at most once, and it, that's kind of once or more. And there's exactly once, which is kind of a myth. It's more of essentially once um, in, in message mm -hmm. delivery. So actors, um, you know, a basic actor, when it sends a message from one actor to another, it's at least once, maybe once, that there's no guarantee that an act, a message from one actor is going to be received by a you know, the, receive, the, the receiving actor. And I showed that right from the very beginning that we have to think about what happens when the, you know, the, 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 the target does not receive the message because you know, maybe the actor is gone. Maybe the note that that actor happened to be running on is gone, things like that. Um, and <clears throat> so it is it, at least once or maybe once. And that's just a fact of life. Now, mm -hmm. There are, are ways of dealing with that. I mean, and that's part of it is, you know, it's like you get the timeout. It's like, okay, you know, A tried to send a message to B, got a timeout, which means B never got the message, or we don't know what happened. B maybe got the message, but was unable to send a response back. All kinds of really interesting things can happen there. Uh, but A needs to, at least A knows, all right, I, I never got a response back. What am I going to do? So you can design the actor to deal with that, which starts to move you into the realm of, um, the at, at most ones um, where say the A uh, sees that it, it never got a response back so now it does a retry it's going to try again and again and again until it does get a response back or it tried enough times and it, it gives up so um, that's you know, kind of moving up to a level where it's not out of the box um, basic actor behavior but it, there is something within Akka itself where you can have at least once message delivery. It's another feature of Akka where you can implement it or, or where you can use it. But I guess the point is you can also implement it yourself. Another thing is that um, in things like Logom, for example, uh, and this is with the uh, Akka persistence and Akka persistence query, there is a uh, um, mechanics built in there for at least once message delivery. So we, we do have it in Akka. There are places where uh, it's already built in to do at least once message delivery. Um, and you can certainly implement it on your own, but it, you, know, you have to be aware that you know, at the basic actor level, it's at, um, at most once, and there are features of Akka where you, you do get the at least once message delivery guarantee. And then the exactly once, you know, it's kind of, a, a myth and it's a more of a, it's like an essentially once. Um, you can do it, you can kind of do it essentially once, but we just don't have enough time to talk about it here because you could spend 15, 30 minutes just talking about that. All right. Well, uh, let's see. The next most popular topic was, you know, how, what does it look like when you want to deploy Akka cluster on Kubernetes or Mesosphere DCOS or AWS or Google Cloud and uh, Cloud and um, oh. Cloud Platform, sorry, uh, and so on. 
So there, it, it, it's pretty interesting because for an ACA cluster, ACA is happy as long as it's running in JVMs and those JVMs can talk to each other across the network. And there's the idea that um, there's this concept of seed nodes where a couple of nodes, like two or three of the nodes, are identified as seed nodes. And what that means is that as other nodes join the cluster, when they, they join the cluster, the act of joining the cluster is the new node sends a message or communicates with one of the seed nodes to say, hey, I want to join. You know, so, so it needs to know, have some address, network address that it can send a message to or talk to to say, I want to join the cluster. And then they, that node uh, can now start talking to other nodes in the cluster. So when you move to a cloud-like environment, like say, for example, Kubernetes, then the, the situation is that um, the seed nodes have to be fed in from Kubernetes. So we've, got, um, we've done a lot of work there um, to make this work where the idea is that um, as, a, as a cluster comes up, there's the prop, it's kind of the propagation of the seed nodes is, hap, is handled uh, as the different um, pods come up in the, in the Kubernetes cluster. The, you know, the information is fed in uh, dealing with the, with, the, with the whole seed nodes. So I guess the, to sum it up, it doesn't really matter what the cloud is. It's in, in a static environment where you have static nodes and well-known IP addresses, you just like have a static configuration file where you say these IPs and ports are the seed nodes. In a cloud-like environment, that has to be fed in at runtime. And there's solutions for dealing for doing it with Kubernetes and AWS and um, I think, you know, in one form or another, all the different you know, like, um, cloud solutions where we're handling um, the, the management of the seed nodes in a more dynamic fashion. It, it's, it's just a matter of, of uh, using the, the whatever approach is provided for the different cloud environments. All right, thanks for that answer. Well, folks, we're out of time for today. Hugh, thanks so much for joining us, even though you've got a cold. Uh, we're, send, we're all sending our best wishes and health to you. For those of you who'd like to learn more, you'll receive an email in the next few business days. In the meantime, you can check out akka.io as well as developer.lightbend.com. There's tons and tons of resources to keep you very busy. And of course, you can always reach out to me directly at oliver at lightbend.com if you'd like to get in touch with somebody. So thanks again, Hugh, and have a wonderful day, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.